Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with Tarot Symbolism, the 10th numbered card, The Will of Fortune, Le Re de Fortune, by Manly P. Hall. An article taken from the All Seeing Eye, Volume 5, Number 12, September 1931. With this article, we must bring to a close our brief study of the major trumps of the tarot deck. It may be remembered that according to the ancient system, all compound numbers can be reduced to the simple digit by the process called Pythagorean reduction. Thus, 35 would become 8 by adding the individual numbers and considering their sum as symbolic of the original figure. It follows, therefore, that all the trumps can be reduced to the first ten. For, as in Freemasonry, the higher degrees are simply symbolic amplifications of the Blue Lodge, so the first ten of the Tarot major trumps are the foundation of all that follows. The Will of Fortune, or the World as it is sometimes called, reveals a contrivance somewhat resembling the eight-spoked will of the Buddhist philosophy. The will stands in a small ship floating upon water, which reminds us of the old premise of Thales that the world itself was a vessel floating in the sea of eternity and supported by the etheric waters of space. In this card we may consider the sea to represent universal nature in its diffused state as space, or the matrix of creation filled with the amniotic fluids of chaos. Upon the surface of this sea in the card floats the Ark, or Argo, which to the philosopher signifies the Logos or the individualized and objectified creative expression. It is written in the Kojiki, the Japanese book of creation, that the gods brought the earth into manifestation by stringing the waters of space with bamboo rods or reeds. When they lifted these from the water, Bits of mud clinging to the ends of the rods drifted backwards to the surface of space, causing an island to be built up. The island represents, of course, the spiritual nature of the world, which, as a sacred ship, bears within it all living things, supporting them upon the surface of chaos. It is written in the ancient mysteries that Noah caused the body of Adam to be brought into the ark, where it was worshipped as a symbol of life and the covenant between the creator and creation. Hargrave Jennings is of the opinion that a phallic stone was employed as the symbol of Adam and of generation, and the establishment of living things upon the earth. Thus we find a great pillar rising out of the ark, Supporting at its upper end the will of the world, whose seven revealed spokes and one concealed are representative of the seven Elohim or gods, who are the children or outpouring of the protagonas or first man. The will also consists of three major parts, the hub, the rim, and the middle circle halfway between them. The hub is the supreme world upon which all things rotate. It is the very nature of the objectified Logos himself, through whose permanence all impermanent things are sustained. This is the immovable axis of the sun about which its two outer shell-like globes revolve, one upon a vertical and the other upon a horizontal axis. The circumference signifies what the Pythagoreans termed the inferior world or the elementary creation, and the inner circle between the hub and the circumference is the superior world of the Greeks, the abode of celestial demons and terrestrial gods. Thus, the world in its three departments, suspended from, or in this case elevated from, the very nature of the Logos itself is a vast chakra or spinning wheel of force, a center of consciousness and intelligence in the universe one of the numerous shining beads upon the thread of space. There also rises from the Ark, the two serpents, under which form, according to the Persian myths, Ormus and Almarion contend for the world egg, or the astral soul of creation. The presence of the two serpents, 
the white signifying light and the black darkness reveals to the observant that the whole vertical column with its wheels is but an amplified form of the caduceus of Hermes. Hence, the vertical column supporting the wheel becomes the spine, which, as the channel for the moving cosmic fire principle, is the support of rational life. Two creatures are moving upon the spokes of the wheel. The one on the right is Anubis, the guardian of the souls and the Egyptian symbol of mortal or human mind. Anubis, who has the head of a dog, climbs up the wheel, holding aloft a winged scepter as the symbol of aspiration. On the opposite side, Typhon, the destroyer, emblematic of the animal propensities and the elemental forces of nature, is falling backward into chaos, of which he is the manifested principle. The will with its ascending and descending figures signifies that as mind ascends to take dominion over the processes of life, disorder and destruction are overcome. The genius of matter falling as the genius of mind rises. At the top of the will is a seated sphinx holding a sword and with outspread wings. Several authors have interpreted this sphinx to symbolize equilibrium or the balance of all forces of nature. A more careful investigation, however, reveals that the sphinx of Erephus is the proper symbol of illusion, which will destroy all incapable of answering its riddle. The whole sphere of nature as man knows it is, but a shadow of reality. These circumstances of temporal existence are transitory and unreal. In fact, we live in a phantasmagoria of distorted incidents and conditions. Like Oedipus, each must, therefore, face life and answer its riddle. If we answer the riddle wrongly, we are destroyed. If we answer it correctly, for us, the illusion destroys itself. Hence, it is not sufficient for us to regard the Sphinx as the keeper of the gates of mystery. We should realize that for which the Sphinx stands and learn that illusion itself is the keeper of reality. For between every man and reality intervenes the illusionary sphere with its numerous fantastic unrealities. Crowned with the Sphinx, the will of fortune discloses that the entire will itself is an illusion with good and bad, but terms. Sustained upon the surface of space itself, creation never entirely regains its own reality until it returns once more to its space consciousness. To the older symbols contained upon this card, we have added the Pyramid of Dots, which was the symbol of Pythagoras for the world. This world consisted of one spirit or life, which manifested through duality and created the three worlds, which in turn are revealed physically through the four elements. As the early philosophers maintained that in Contractus, or the ten dots, is contained the entire wisdom of mankind, so this will sits forth to the informed the entire riddle of life. In passing, we would like to say for the other major tarot cards that their full number, 22 indicates the 22 orders of Chaldean letters, which became the basis of the Hebrew alphabet. In addition to the major trumps, there are four suits of minor cards, each containing 14 cards and revealing through their symbolism the whole Kabbalistic arrangement of creation. The four suits of the minor trumps are the four worlds of the Zohar, through which the shining splendor of the Creator descends to be finally manifested in the forms and elements of the physical universe. Each of these suits consists of ten numbered cards, which are the Sephiroth in each world, or the four trees, of ten blossoms each, which are reflections of each other, the higher into the lower. The four court cards in each suit are the four letters of the sacred name, again shadowed into the four words. When the minor trumps are considered in connection with the major trumps, it is possible so to lay out the cards that the entire system of spiritual progress can be discovered. According to this arrangement, the full or unnumbered card becomes the neophyte, the soul searching for initiation, 
who wanders through the maze of the other cards as through the labyrinth of some mysterious temple. It will be noted that the figures which have been added to the lesser trump cards have been chosen consistently. To the suit of the coins we have added a series of cubes, these cubes revealing the plane upon which the suit functions. To the suit of the cups we have added a lozenge shaped halo, which again reveals the cabalistic import of the cards. The suit of the scepters have received a triangle and the suit of swords a crux and seta. Thus a cipher alphabet has been devised, based entirely upon cabalistic keys. The combination of the various cards within each other gives a clue to the sequence of the symbols, and those seriously interested in the study of the tarot would do well to analyze this sequence carefully. In connection with the tarot, as well as nearly all such devices, it should be remembered that the information which they apparently reveal is not really in the cards themselves, but in the individual who uses them, the cards serving simply as focal points for the attention, elements of concentration through which the natural intelligence of the student can be released into expression. The pictures invoke thoughts, thus stimulating the mind and bringing into objective expression ideas which might otherwise remain latent throughout life. Plato was right in affirming that learning is simply remembering. If we can stimulate the inner faculties to the degree that they will bring to our objective attention a small part of the accumulated wisdom of the ages, we shall discover ourselves to be very wise indeed. The tarot cards were scientifically designed to stimulate the inner intellectual faculties. They were to draw forth from the most secret recesses of the heart and mind the truth that had been stored there for uncounted ages. It is, therefore, much better for a person desiring information to seek it within himself to search for it within his own soul than to ask others to inform him directly. We are not enriched by that which is given to us, but rather by that which we discover through the activity of our own faculties and perceptions. We grow through effort, and the effort to release thought results in the perfection of the equipment of thought. For hundreds of years, numerous students of mysticism have pondered upon the secrets of the tarot, they have grown wise for their efforts. The tarot cards are simply a stimulus to create imagination and analogy. They invite us to use every atom of knowledge we have in the interpretation of their cryptic riddles. If we accept the invitation and apply all our resourcefulness to the task, we shall probably be pleasantly surprised to discover that we know a great deal more about the mysteries of life than we ourselves realized. Of course, we may think that the cards revealed it, and that from the little pieces of pasteboard we gathered the priceless facts. If this is what we choose to believe, it is of little importance. The fact remains that we have made new applications of thought. This alone is important. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.